Welcome to the first episode in our video series about the Founding Fathers of the United States of America. <laughs> now, this video series is not some boring recitation of dusty old facts. No, 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 no. We are going to have some fun here. <laughs> so we are going to understand the context of the time. We're going to see the situations that confronted these founding fathers. And we're going to see what they believed and what they did. So this is going to give us a great understanding of who these founding fathers actually were as people, as human beings. And along the way, we will also get a wonderful sense of the fascinating story of the founding of this nation. So without further ado, let's jump right in to episode one. Our story begins in colonial America. So let's transport ourselves back in time and back to the early 1770s, leading up to the American Revolutionary War. So we are back here in colonial America. So colonial America, what, what does that mean? Well, colonial colony, it's the same word, colonial colony. What it was, was America was a colony of England. Okay, so that means England owns America. So in by colonial America, I'm referring to British colonial America. So this is the territory that England owned in America. So England owns America, right? Now, again, this is only the British territory, so it's only sort of New England along the East Coast here, the 13 colonies. But it's uh, amazing to think. So England owns America. Now, England, so England's running the whole show, right? There's, you know, there, there are people who are in, in important leadership positions who are English, right? The, the, there's British soldiers all around, right? And even people in colonial America who have you know senior positions ultimately they have to report back to England and the authority goes all the way up to the crown the king of England so England is making all the important decisions England owns the territory and England is running the show okay so pretty amazing to think that you know England owns the place <laughs> now some people might think well yeah okay but that wasn't for very long England only owned it for a brief period of time because America then certainly came along, declared its independence, and created its own United States. But, in fact, it was a long period of time. England actually did own America for a long period of time. So the first English settlement in America was Jamestown. So Jamestown, that was in 1607. Now, some people think, and they get this confused with the pilgrims and the mayflower so the ship was the mayflower mayflower the pilgrims left plymouth in england on the ship of the mayflower and sailed across the atlantic ocean and landed at plymouth rock in in massachusetts or so the legend goes so some people think that it was the mayflower and the pilgrims who were the the first british settlement but in fact they came later the the pilgrims were in 1620 so that was effectively the the second major settlement of britain in in america but the first was jamestown so 1607 that was jamestown so jamestown is located in virginia in the state of virginia and it's located just south of washington dc so a little bit south of washington dc right in the the area of the chesapeake bay there so jamestown jamestown actually is basically in the exact same location as williamsburg colonial williamsburg those two are basically in the same location jamestown and williamsburg now many people are more familiar with colonial williamsburg and that is because colonial williamsburg has been restored and today you can go there and visit it today it's a huge tourist attraction all these buildings have been restored mainly courtesy of the rockefeller fortune <laughs> but nonetheless it's a 
you know, a fantastic restoration actually. So you can go and you can, you know, see these period buildings and what it was like in, in, to live in, in colonial America back in the day. And there's all these people who dress in period costumes and, you know, all this. It's a, it's a great, a great place to visit. So, uh, so, but they're basically in the same location. So the story there, what happened was, is the original settlement was in Jamestown in 1607. But then after a while, they kind of figured out, you know what? We settled on the wrong land. <laughs> There's better land right over there, right up there. You know, the land's on higher ground. It's, you know, less swampy, less mosquitoes. You know, that's, that's much better ground. So eventually they ended up moving the settlement. So this was in 1699. So almost 100 years later, they moved the settlement from Jamestown just up the way to Williamsburg. So that's the relationship between those two settlements, Jamestown and, and Williamsburg. Basically the same location. So you can still visit Jamestown to this day, although there's, there's not much to see there. There's like a few ruins and you can sort of see some ex excavations on where some old buildings were, but there's not much there. The, the main you know, tourist attraction is now in Colonial Williamsburg because it has been restored. But so that's Jamestown. So Jamestown was the first permanent English settlement in America. Now England had actually tried before, so there were a number of other settlements earlier but that they did they never caught on they never became permanent so Jamestown was the first permanent establishment so that was in 1607 now you think about it America did not declare its independence until 1776 okay so that is about 170 years later Okay, so that means that we had colonial America for 170 years. So England owned America for 170 years. Now, if you think about that today, think about America today. So it kind of feels like America's been around forever and it's so permanent that it's, you know, it's been around forever and of course it's going to always be around because it's so permanent. But America's only been around for some 240 years. So 240 years, 170 years, you know, roughly the same amount of time. So, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, wow, you really see that it, this was a long period of time that England owned America. So back in colonial America, so what was happening was, you know, initially the, the first settlers were from, were from England. They were all English, right? They, they came over across the Atlantic Ocean and they were all from England. But then as they started building out their settlements, they started staying here. They had children. Then those children had children. As time went by, the years go by. So after 170 years in, in colonial America, you kind of have these sort of two kinds of people. Some people who were born and lived their entire lives in America and sort of their family. Like you know, they may have been born in America, their parents may have been born in America, and even their grandparents may have been born in America. Multiple generations of people who had lived their entire lives in America, they'd never even been to England, right? So this sort of was creating a little bit of an identity of people who were in America as opposed to England. But you still had people who were coming over from England and, you know, living there. Some people would go back and, you know, come over and all that. And England was, you know, the home country. So they kind of felt, you know, like a little bit uh, superior here if you were, you know, from England. So this is what was going on in colonial America. So what happened, right? Why isn't it still colonial America? Well, it turns out it's all about money. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how many of these, you know, big issues back in history and even today, even in contemporary times today, how many of these huge issues, these huge developments come down to being about money. It's amazing. It's it's shocking that we have not figured out a better way to get along with each other, you know, that it's all about money here. But it was all about money. So what happened was England decided to raise taxes on the colonists, <laughs> on colonial America. And the colonists said, we don't like that. We don't want to have to pay more taxes. <laughs> now, this is portrayed in many textbooks as being, you know, this was an outrage that England was taxing, you know, the, the colonists. An outrage. And of course, the colonists uh, should resist this and not have to pay taxes. And what a wonderful thing that you don't have to pay taxes. And no wonder it was, you know, they went to war and all this. But if you think about it from England's perspective, it actually 
made a lot of sense. It was actually very rational. So what, from England's perspective, what England was saying was basically, look, England had spent all this money investing in colonial America, right? England was the one over centuries, <laughs> right? They're the ones who spent all this money sending all these voyages across the Atlantic Ocean and establishing these settlements and building out these settlements. And also England had been defending it, right? Sending all these, you know, these military, you know, operations over there and to protect it and defend it. And in fact, England had just finished fighting a war in colonial America. And the war was against France. So France also had their colonial territory in America, and France and England were fighting over territory. So England had just spent all this money on that war against France, and England won. So now all the colonists in America, are they gained all this territory, and the threat of being attacked by France was now gone. So they're about to enter this period of peace and prosperity. So from England's perspective, these colonists should be very grateful and they should be glad that this war was just won and they should contribute their fair share. So that's basically what England was saying. England was saying, look, colonists, we just spent all this money on you know, building your settlements and defending you in wars. You have to pay your fair share. So that's why they raised taxes. But the colonists said, no, 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 no. We don't want to pay more taxes, taxation without representation and all this. So this was the inception of the Founding Fathers, right here. This is what started it. So what happened was there were a number of these leaders in these colonies who started getting some bright ideas here, which is always dangerous. <laughs> so they started thinking, you know what? We don't want to pay these taxes, additional taxes back to Britain. And in fact, what do we need Britain for anyway? <laughs> right? Why don't we establish our own independent nation, establish our own nation, kick out Britain, and then we won't have to pay any money back to Britain. We can keep all the money for ourselves. <laughs> okay? This was the inception of the movement towards independence, and this was the beginning of the Founding Fathers. So the Founding Fathers were these leaders in these colonies who were in favor of this movement towards independence and not having to pay any taxes back to Britain. So this period in, in history is sometimes in textbooks portrayed as being this wonderful thing, you know, this wonderful time of seeking freedom and seeking independence and establishing your own nation and all of that. And certainly there is an element of truth to that. But also, this was an extremely difficult time to be alive here in this period. And the reason was because both sides here were beginning to form you know, these two opposing sides. And thus, conflict was developing here. Conflict was brewing. So the one side was the loyalists. So these were people who would be loyal, remain loyal to the British crown, loyal to Britain. And the other side was the patriots. So these were the people in America who were saying, we want to establish our own independent nation. So you had the loyalists against the patriots. And they were sort of increasingly becoming opposed to one another. And the potential for conflict was growing ever more. So it seemed like we are headed in a direction for war here. Now, this was an extremely difficult time to be alive because think about all the people who were sort of caught in the middle, right? There are many people who are just, they just want to live their own lives here. And they were like, look, it's, it's not so important. We just don't want to go to war. I mean, that's the most important thing. We shouldn't be going to war and killing each other here. That's the most important thing. It's less important whether it's under Britain, whether we live under Britain or whether we live under the Patriots. Uh, we just shouldn't be going to war. But all the people were forced into this conflict because both sides forced all the people to pick a side, right? Both sides were saying, either you're with us or you're against us. And if you're against us, you know what that means? That means you could be killed, right? So you now, all these people now were forced to pick a side. Even if you didn't want to pick a side, even if you were saying, look, I'm against war. I, I, it, it doesn't matter. Let's just not have war. No, 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 not good enough. You have to pick a side. 
So this tore people apart. So you know, if you pick, you know, so if you pick like the the patriots and the loyalists get a hold of you, the loyalists will kill you. If you pick the loyalists and the patriots get a hold of you, the patriots might kill you. So uh, this was an extremely difficult time, and it was tearing families apart. So you had families. You know, some members of the family picked the patriots, and some members of the same family picked the loyalists, right? So these families are, you know, being torn apart. It's just an extremely difficult time. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute. Why would anyone side with the loyalists, <laughs> right? Why would anyone side with Britain? Why wouldn't everyone side with freedom, right? Independence. Everybody wants freedom, independence. Hooray! Why wouldn't everybody side with the you know the the patriots in this this movement towards independence. Well, there were a lot of reasons actually that people sided with the loyalists and with Britain. So one reason is because look, Britain had been ruling this territory for you know almost 200 years now, right? So a lot of people felt like Britain was their home country. Britain was their nation. They felt loyalty to their nation, loyalty to the crown. So this whole upstart movement here was it was treason to go against your own nation. So that's one reason that people you know, remain loyalist. Another reason was Britain was this global empire, right? They were this huge military power, right? So a lot of people felt like there is no way in the world that these upstarts colonists here could ever win a war against Britain, this global military power. Right, so they're thinking, uh, like, we can't side with these upstarts. We have to side with the people who are going to win the war here. Right, so that's another reason people sided with Britain. And another reason was a lot of people's livelihoods, their 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 jobs, their businesses were tied to the British system and the British rule. You know, some people were trading with Britain back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. Some people were part of the British, you know, structure, and some people's businesses just depended upon this British system of rule. So to all of a sudden oppose Britain and go to war with Britain meant, you know, their entire livelihoods would would just collapse. Their businesses would collapse and you know, they you know, their livelihoods would be gone. So this is a, another reason that people sided with Britain. So a lot of people actually sided with the loyalists to remain loyal with Britain. So this was extremely difficult in the country here and it was, you know, tearing people apart. So this is going on though. This is so this movement towards independence is increasing and these leaders in the movement are continuing to build support for it. And this was the beginning of the founding fathers. This is who these founding fathers were, these people who are you were increasingly trying to build this movement towards independence. So eventually this movement towards independence starts taking action. Okay, so events begin to occur. So in 1773, we had the Boston Tea Party. And then two years later, the first shot was fired. So this was in Concord and Lexington, Massachusetts. And this was known as the shot that was heard around the world, right? So it was, it was named this because it was, you know, this is the first shot that was fired in the American Revolution. And the American Revolution was huge, a huge event. I mean, this is the first time in world history that you know, a, a colony here was successfully, turned out, rebelling against its colonial ruler, right? So this revolution was a, a huge event. So the news of this revolution spread around the world. So that's why this shot is, is known as the first shot of the American Revolutionary War is known as the shot that was heard around the world. So that was in 1775. And then only a year later, America declares its independence. Okay, it's independence from England. So here we are. This movement towards independence is now fully underway. So to get ourselves in the spirit here of being back in the day, back in colonial America and back in America at the time of independence, our background here is Independence Hall. This is the outside of Independence Hall, and it is located right in the heart of downtown Philadelphia. And this is the inside of Independence Hall. This is where all the magic happened. 
<laughs> and indeed, there was a lot of magic that happened. There were two extraordinary events that happened right here in the same place. First, in 1776, this is where the Founding Fathers gathered and agonized and made the decision of whether to break away from England and go to war with England to create the independent United States of America, right here in this room. And when they, did, when they decided to do that, this is where they decided to create the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so that was in 1776. Then, 11 years later, so 1787, the Founding Fathers met here again in this exact same place for the Constitutional Convention. And this is where they created and wrote the United States Constitution. This is where they invented the United States government that we have today, right here in this room. <laughs> so if you let your imagination run wild, you can envision the Founding Fathers being in this room and they come alive. They're negotiating with each other. They're offering new proposals and they're giving speeches passionately, arguing for their views on government right here in this room. Amazing. Let's focus on the first of these two historic events that happened here at Independent Hall. So this is back in 1776. The Founding Fathers came here to Independence Hall under the Second Continental Congress to deliberate over this question of whether to break away from England and form an independent nation, which meant going to war with England. So one of the delegates here, one of the Founding Fathers, was a, a guy from Massachusetts by the name of John Adams. Now, John Adams was a strong voice in favor of independence. So he wanted to break away and go to war and the whole thing. He was, he was gung-ho and ready to do it. So John Adams, actually, interestingly, is, is well known for a couple people that he's associated with in his life. So one is Sam Adams, or Samuel Adams. <laughs> and this is the guy who has his name on the beer today, Sam Adams. <laughs> So that was John Adams' older second cousin. And Sam Adams was this famous revolutionary in Boston. He too wanted independence. He was one of the famous instigators of the Boston Tea Party in 1773. And he later became this popular politician in Massachusetts. So John Adams was influenced by his older cousin, Sam Adams. So John, John Adams is also known for his wife, Abigail Adams. So John and Abigail Adams have this famous relationship through in our nation's history, right? Because it was this long love relationship that lasted their entire lives. And they wrote these marvelous letters to each other back and forth over the years. And that correspondence has survived to this day. And it is wonderful to read. There's, it is so rich with uh, all sorts of stuff, with their personal life, their love life, to, to their political life and what was going on. And in fact, this is one of the cool things about their relationship is John Adams, not only did he love his wife passionately, but he also respected her for her wisdom and intelligence. And she was one of his closest advisors in his career. So that was a wonderful thing showing how he respected women. And this is back in you know, the late 1700s, early 1800s. So that's pretty cool. In fact, there's this famous letter that she wrote to him while he was actually at the Independence Hall for this, the Second Congress, trying to figure out this government, trying to figure out you know, how to set up this government. She wrote to him and said, John, you be sure to remember the ladies when he's setting up this government. <laughs> so that was, that's pretty cool. That's one of the things she's famous for. So John Adams was the strongly in favor of independence at this you know, Continental Congress. So John Adams was born in Massachusetts in 1735. So this was you know 40 years before the revolution. So he was born under the British colonial rule as most of these founding fathers were. So he was born into a family that was not wealthy, but they were comfortable. So middle class, upper middle class, but they did have this family name. You know, so they had been in this 
country, America, for five generations. This was back then, <laughs> okay, in the you know early mid 1700s. So they had this sort of you know noble family name and and history. So he felt a part of this family legacy, and he was educated. He went to Harvard. Now this is at a time where most people had hardly any education at all, much less college and you got John Adams going to Harvard. So he had a privileged background even though he wasn't super wealthy. So uh, he, you know, after college he ends up going into the practice of law. He ends up going to Boston and practicing law in Boston. That was his, his profession and from there he got active in the revolution and the movement towards independence and he was influenced by his cousin Samuel Adams and, and that's how he, he became strongly in favor of an independent nation. So then as a delegate to Massachusetts to this Continental Congress he was a very well respected guy. So he was one of the older guys you know, at the at the convention, and he w he was well known at that time because he had already written a lot. He was a great writer, and he was well known for his abilities, his his, his written word, and 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 a strong advocate of independence. So at the time of this, you know, the Second Continental Congress here, he was he was a a leader, and he's strongly in favor of of breaking away, going to war, and and establishing independence. So let's put John Adams up on our big board here so we can start keeping track of the founding fathers that we're going to compare and contrast here. All right, so that's John Adams. Now, another guy who was also at the Second Continental Congress here where they're trying to figure out whether to declare independence is a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson and John Adams get to know each other here at this Continental Congress. And they totally hit it off. <laughs> they really like each other. They become fast friends. In fact, this becomes one of the great relationships in history. You know, Th John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. So, you know, they're both at this Continental Congress and, you know, they're getting to know each other and they're both giving speeches and, you know, you know, pontificating on their ideas about government and all that. And they both really respect each other and, and respect each other's, you know, intelligence and wisdom and knowledge so they really they gravitate towards each other and they they become you know fast friends so this is a, an, an amazing relationship and it, this is true despite the fact that they have very different backgrounds so remember John Adams was born up north in New England in Massachusetts and he came from you know he didn't have a lot of money and he he actually came from a profession he worked you know he's a lawyer he, he, he worked for his living Thomas Jefferson on the other hand was born in the south he was born in Virginia and he was born into one of these wealthy plantation owners, you know, so his, his family for generations before him owned this vast amount of land with, you know, slaves and this huge plantation and, and he was born into this wealthy family, so the wealthy elite in the South. So he was born in 1743, so he was a little bit younger than John Adams, about eight years younger than John Adams and he was you know a member of the you know of the elite in the south now uh, thomas jefferson turned out to be this incredible uh, you know renaissance man i mean he was this turned out to be the, this man of the enlightenment it was an amazing uh, you know he was an amazing guy i mean he had all these interests he, his mind he was just he was interested in everything i mean he was interested in, in history in law in uh, you know architecture in botany <laughs> you know he spoke several languages you know he loved books he he loved books he a, any book he could get his hand on he would read voraciously he collected books he had this vast collection of books and this was back at a time where you know you couldn't just go on the internet and check wikipedia on something you know so he, he was acquiring books books was how you acquired world knowledge you read the classics you know history i mean he, he is you know an amazing and, and enlightened guy and you know he believed in democracy and and you know these ideas that were sort of spreading around around western europe so he, he turned out to be this you know pretty amazing amazing guy but he was from the you know the the this wealthy aristocracy so at being from that family he ended up going into politics and he ended up going into the Virginia state legislature. Now there was no federal government at the time, so there was no federal Congress or anything. So being in the state legislature was, you know, the big deal. And in fact, particularly in Virginia, 
because Virginia was a hugely important state. I mean, it was huge, but it was also, remember, this is the state where England first came in and founded the entire new, new world for England, right? So this was Jamestown and colonial Williamsburg in, in Yorktown. You know, this was the, the, the head of Britain's, you know, entire empire in the new world, right, in Virginia. So Virginia was hugely important state. So Thomas Jefferson was a respected and senior politician in the state legislature in Virginia. And he actually then became governor. He went on to be elected governor. In fact, he was the governor of Virginia during the revolution, <laughs> which is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. In fact, there was a controversy at one point, the, the British soldiers came to march on him with a secret expedition to march on his plantation and grab him and take him prisoner. But he found out about it and he actually fled. And this was a, a, a somewhat controversial because, you know, he was, some people accused him of being a coward for fleeing instead of fighting and standing up and standing his ground. And he was actually not reelected after that. But nonetheless, he was, he was a governor of Virginia. So he, he went into politics in Virginia and, and that is how he became a, a delegate to the state of Virginia and came to the Continental Congress here. And this is where he met John Adams. So, you know, he and John Adams are here in the Continental Congress with everybody else. There was, you know, between 50 and 60 delegates somewhere around there. And they are struggling with this question of whether to break away and form an independent nation. And the reason it's so difficult is because there are a number of states, a number of these colonies, that do not want to go to war against Britain. <laughs> okay, they just think it is a bad idea. And for good reason. I mean, you know, you're going to war against this, you know, this great British empire. You know, it doesn't seem to be very wise. So it's certainly understandable. Now, this is an area, if you're interested in this area, this is a great area for further study because it is rich with, with all sorts of political intrigue and plots and all sorts of stuff about how it all happened. But eventually, they came to a consensus and these colonies decided to declare their independence and go to war with Britain. Wow. Okay, so that was huge, huge. All right, so once they declare their independence, and this was here, right here in Independence Hall, right in this room, this is where they did all the debating, and this is where they came to the conclusion to declare independence. So once they decide to declare independence, they now realize that what they need to do is they need to write up a document. They need to write down on a piece of paper their justification, justification their reason for why it was okay for them to break away from Britain. And the main reason they wanted to do this is because they wanted to be recognized legitimately as their own legitimate nation. They wanted to be recognized by other countries around the world because they needed other support from other countries around the world. They needed to trade with other countries around the world. So if they didn't do this, other countries might think, look, you know, you're just, you're doing something that's illegal. You're not allowed to break away from Britain. This is just an internal dispute. So I'm not going to recognize you, America, as a new country because, you, you know, you don't have any good reasons. You're being disloyal. You're breaking the law by breaking away and you're part of Britain. I'm not going to recognize you independent. So they needed to write up a document that gave a sufficient good reasons for why it was okay for them to break away. So this was the Declaration of Independence. So they decide, we've got to write a Declaration of Independence. They all agree, we've got to do that. All right, so the question becomes, who's going to write it? <laughs> okay, and the natural answer was, everybody thought, oh, it's obvious, John Adams. John Adams is going to write it. He's the natural choice. He's this great writer. He'd written all this other stuff. He was really well known. He, you know, he's very persuasive and he was this guy who was passionately in favor of independence. So he was the natural choice. So what they decided to do though, instead of just giving it to John Adams, they decided to appoint a committee and have a committee of five people. And then that committee will go off and write a draft of the Declaration of Independence. This is in the summer of 1776. So who's on the committee? Well, certainly John Adams is on the committee because everybody thought he was the guy who was going to write it. So John Adams. So John Adams then makes sure that his buddy Thomas Jefferson also gets appointed to the committee. Okay, so Thomas Jefferson's on the committee. And then there were three other guys. Another guy was Benjamin Franklin. 
<laughs> Interestingly, he was on the committee too. Okay, so then the question becomes, of these five guys on the committee, which guy is going to actually write the thing? So the obvious answer is, of course, John Adams, right? So they all think John Adams. Yeah, of course, John Adams. But John Adams says, no, I think Thomas Jefferson should write it. And Thomas Jefferson is like, what? Me? You want me to write it? <laughs> and Adams like, yes, you should write it. Jefferson is like, no, no, Adams, you should write it. You're the guy. You're the natural. You're the great writer. You're well known. Yeah, you know, you're the guy who should write it. Adams says, nope, nope, you should write it, Jefferson. So Adams insists, and Adams tells Jefferson, look, I'll help you. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. I'll, I'll look over your shoulder and, and I'll help you write it, but you should be the author. So Jefferson finally agrees. He finally says, you know, okay, reluctantly, but he agrees, okay, I'll write it. So Thomas Jefferson writes a draft of the Declaration of Independence. Now, certainly it was edited, okay? So when Jefferson wrote it, he gave it to the committee, and certainly the committee of the five people edited it. You know, John Adams edited it. Benjamin Franklin supposedly made some famous edits. And then once the committee, you know, produced their draft, they sent it to the wider Congress, and then Congress edited it too. So it ended up getting edited very heavily. In fact, Jefferson said at one point that Congress, oh my God, they shredded my draft. They ruined it. <laughs> But the final draft, I mean, it was written by, by Jefferson, and certainly the final draft had a lot of what Jefferson originally wrote. So Jefferson writes this Declaration of Independence. This document, the Declaration of Independence, is one of the most famous documents in world history. It is amazing. Why, why, why is it so famous? It's so famous because it sets forth the reasons why it was okay for these people to break away and form their own independent nation. This document serves as the basis of human rights to this day. It also kicked off over a century of other countries around the world being inspired by this Declaration of Independence and writing their own versions or their own documents that were based upon it. Okay, It was an amazing document. Now. There was a sentence. There is one sentence in this document that is the most famous, and I'm going to read it to you. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That sentence, it is said, is the most famous sentence in the entire English language. <laughs> All around the world, the entire English language. That one sentence, okay, it's amazing. Now, why? Why is it so famous? Well, it's so famous because of the focus on that all men are created equal and the, the, the equality part of it is what is so inspirational and what is so famous. Now, the all men, the men part of it is somewhat controversial, right? Because, well, did he not mean women? So women aren't equal and did he not mean slaves and people of other races? And, you know, there is all that. But there is an argument that, that says that what he really meant was he meant it man as in mankind, meaning all human beings, women, slaves, everybody. But of course, he couldn't enforce that. You know, one person couldn't enforce that at the time because it wasn't the custom at the time. There's no way one person could, you know, give rights to women at the time. It just, it was, society was not ready to move in that direction. But he wrote the document to encompass this for the future. So there is that argument. But even if you assume that it was only men, that he was excluding women and excluding slaves, it was still a radical document. And the reason it was radical, because at the time, and in fact all throughout history, men were not created equal, even just men. They were not created equal. There was a class structure. Okay, There was noble, nobility and wealthy men, and then there were peasants. Peasants were not equal to the nobility. Right? No way. Not here, not in America, not in England, not in Europe, you know, all around the world. There was a rigid class structure. 
But Jefferson comes along, writes this Declaration of Independence, and says, no, that's not true. All men are created equal. Even if you're a peasant, you're, you're equal to the nobility. It was stunning, stunning. Okay, This is one of the reasons why it is one of the foundational documents to the entire doctrine of human rights all around the world. Okay? So that's, that was pretty amazing. So there is another fascinating aspect about this one sentence. Now this is less widely known, but I st think it's still really cool. It's just, I think it's just less apparent. So you, it's sort of, you have to infer it and, and it's implied in the document, but it's still pretty cool. So, so the idea was that historically, you know, all power comes from God and God gives power to the king or the ruler. So the king then, underneath the king, is all the people. Okay, but power comes from God to the king. So the king is a very special person. Okay, the king is better than all the other people. Why? Because the king was selected by God. God selected this king. So this king has powers and abilities that other people don't have. And the king is acting on behalf of God because God selected this king. So this king is not just a normal human being. This king is is an extraordinary human being. In fact, many cultures felt that the king was, you know, sort of a demigod or a, a you know, partial god, part human, part god. Some cultures even felt, you know, that the, the king was a god, right? So this king was a, a very special, regarded as a special person, and whatever the king wanted had to be right because that's what God wanted because God selected the king. So, the king then would then, so God gives the power to the king and the king then, all the people below him, and the king could then pick who the king wanted as, you know, as in, his, in his ministers and, and, and for prominent positions and, and he'd also decide who were the peasants, he'd decide everything because the king had the power from God. So what does this famous sentence say? What this famous sentence says is that, no, 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 that's not the way it works. <laughs> it says, all men were endowed by their creator. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute, what does that mean? The creator is God. So previously you had God gave the power to the king. What Jefferson does here in this sentence is he says, he takes God and he moves God, takes God out of the middle of it. <laughs> I'm sorry, not God, the king. So you've got God used to give the power to the king. Jefferson says, no, not the king. The king gets taken out of the middle. And what happens? God endows all the people with the power. <laughs> so the power goes directly from God to all the people. Doesn't go to the king, goes to the people. Then Jefferson goes on in another line, he says, government is derived by, by the consent of the governed. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that the, you know, the power of the government is derived from the consent of the governed. So, so the, the governed are the people down here. They're the governed. And the, you know, the government is the people who govern. So it's the consent of the people. The people must decide or elect their own rulers. That's how rulers come to be, with the consent of the governed. The elected of officials are from the, the people. This is turning it all its head. So, so the power is coming from the people, from the bottom. It's not coming from the top, from God, to elect the rulers. It's coming from the bottom, from the people. And Jefferson goes a step further and says, and by the way, if this ruler is doing a bad job, if the people don't like what this ruler is doing, the people can always take this ruler, kick the ruler out, and replace the ruler with a new ruler of their choice. <laughs> So all the power is coming from the bottom, from the people to, uh, to elect the rulers. This was a radical concept. It was taking the whole old concept and turning it upside down on its head, right? It was amazing. So that is what this sentence is doing. It is, it is amazing. So another thing that it is doing is, is, remember, the whole purpose of this Declaration of Independence was to justify to the rest of the world why we are declaring independence. So why? What's the justification? Why is it okay for America to, to declare independence? Why? Well, in this sentence, what Jefferson is saying is he's saying the reason it's okay is because we are all human beings. And human beings, it's just self-evident. It's just natural that human beings should be able to select their own rulers. 
<laughs> okay, it's like this concept of like natural law, that it's obvious, that it's self-evident, that human beings should be able to have self-government and determine their own governance. This is radical, right? Who are you to say the ordinary people should be able to select their own governance? Power comes from the king, <laughs> right? So he's just turning this notion on its head. And this is why it is you know, a, a, a source document for this whole body of human rights because it's saying human beings the reason that if someone has a right is because they are human that's all it takes if you are a human being then you have these rights okay so it is really an, a profound and an amazing and amazing document now jefferson does go on in the rest of the document to to list particulars you know that the king raised taxes on us and that wasn't fair and that the king quarters troops in our homes and all these uh, other individual things but this sentence was in the preamble of the declaration so it's the sort of the overarching aspect of the Declaration of Independence that says that it is, you know, human beings have individual human rights to select their own self-government. So it was, you know, an amazing document that just, you know, kicked off this whole idea around the world for over a century of, you know, rethinking what governments are and that governments, you know, can, can be democracies. So it is really a, an extraordinary, extraordinary document. So that was Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence. And once he wrote it then, it was, it was taken back to the Continental Congress here in this room and approved and it was signed. Now, was, there's was controversy about when it was signed and when different people signed it, but it is thought that certainly some people here signed it right here in this room at Independence Hall. So, the cat's out of the bag now. They wrote the Declaration of Independence and published it, and the, the King of England receives a copy of the Declaration of Independence. So this means it's going to be full-scale war here with America declaring their independence. So, you know, this kicks off the American Revolutionary War or the War for Independence. And, you know, Britain now has to come in and try to quash this rebellion. So Congress is also faced with the practical problem is they know they're going to be going to war here and there's going to be a large-scale war. So they need to appoint someone as the head of the military. Okay, so who do they appoint? They appoint George Washington. Now this guy is the most famous founding father of all. Okay? He has the nation's capital named after him. Washington, D.C. named after George Washington. And in the nation's capital, he has the Washington Monument that was erected in his honor. And he even has the state of Washington out on the Pacific coast that was named after George Washington. Okay, now if that weren't enough, his head appears on the $1 bill as well as on the quarter. <laughs> All right, now that's pretty famous. And George Washington is known as the father of our country. <laughs> okay, it's hard to get more famous than that. <laughs> All right, so who was this guy? Who was George Washington? So he was born in the South, in Virginia, in this great state of Virginia. Okay, he was born in 1732. So that's, you know, 44 years before the American Revolution. So like a number of these founding fathers, you know, he was born decades before the Revolution. So he was born under the British crown. And he was a citizen loyal to the British crown here in the new American territories here. So um, he was born onto one of these huge plantations in, in Virginia. So his family was one of wealth and privilege. So his, his family had been in this new land for three generations before George Washington. They'd acquired all this land and they started this tobacco plantation. They had all these slaves and, and all that. So George Washington actually ended up inheriting this plantation, the slaves and all that, you know, later in life. So he was born to this sort of upper class elite family in, in the new territory here. And his family was rich, although they weren't super rich, but they did have family connections. So they were connected to other families that were super rich and families that had power and were, had, you know, government positions in Virginia. So through his family connections, George Washington lands one of his first jobs, which was as a land surveyor in Virginia. 
Okay, so he'd go out and, you know, map the land and, and measure the land and all that. And that's kind of pretty cool, actually, if you think about it, because it, it ties into his later career as a military general. So, you know, the, the, a, the land surveyor is an important skill to have because when you're a general in the army fighting battles, the topography of land is critically important. So having a familiarity with topography of the land is, is a, a, a great asset. So because when you're in battles, you know, you need to plan to you know see where the high ground is and take the high ground and position your troops on you know this land or that land and where are the rivers and how are you going to get your troops over the rivers and all of that so his his experience as a young man as a land surveyor is uh is uh, pretty cool that later then uh benefited him as a military general so but george washington was also part of the military even as a younger man so he was part of the militia now, the militia is a little bit different than the regular army. So the regular army is full-time soldiers. So they're, you know, they're paid soldiers. This is what they do as their profession. So they're more, you know, they're more serious. They're better trained. They're better equipped, all that. The militia is, it, it consists of people in the community, you know, so they have other professions, you know, the baker and the, the butcher and the blacksmith, you know, they kind of come out and, on weekends and train and they're, you know, bring their guns and, and all that. So they're kind of a, the junior varsity team. You know, they're not the A team, they're kind of the B team. But nonetheless, they still are a real army. And so this is what George Washington was. He was in the militia and he rose to become a leader of the militia. Now they're still fighting for the same team. So you have the British regular army and then you have the Virginia militia, but they're still on the same team. So the, the, the militia would help out the army. So the army would assign the militia to do various, you know, assignments and missions and, and that sort of thing. Interestingly though, George Washington always wanted to become a fully commissioned officer in the British Army. So he wanted to be part of the real British Army. Uh, but interestingly, you know, he wanted to be a full red coat. <laughs> but interestingly, despite his efforts to try to get that, he was never successful in being a full commissioned officer in the, in the British Army. So, but nonetheless, he was in the, in, the, in the militia. And he was a leader of the militia and he actually saw real fighting in real battles so the the British army did trust him so in one example so the British army sent him to this area of, which later became Fort Duquesne sent George Washington along with his his troop of militiamen so and they actually saw real battle so now you might be thinking well wait a minute real battle was there a war that was going on in America before the American Revolution and the answer is yes, there was. So this is part of what is known as the Seven Years' War. So, so what that was, was that was a war between Britain and France. Now, Britain and France, I mean, an amazing history. They've been fighting each other for centuries. I mean, it's amazing. All over the world in these you know, various locations you know, throughout time. It's amazing. So what was going on in the Seven Years' War was Britain and France were again at war with each other around the world in various locations including the location that was this new America. <laughs> okay, so what was happening was Britain had the 13 colonies that they were trying to build out, but France was in America also trying to build out their own colonies. So France, for example, founded the cities like Detroit in Michigan, they founded St. Louis in Missouri, and they founded New Orleans. Okay, and think about Louisiana, that name, Louisiana, that was named after King Louis, Louisiana Louis, <laughs> okay, King Louis back in, in France. Okay, so, uh, so France is, you know, building out their colonies, trying to, and England is building out their colonies, and they're kind of right next to each other, so this was a recipe for conflict. So as part of this global war between England and France, they were battling each other in war in what is today the United States. So... George Washington was fighting in this war for Britain against France. <laughs> so Britain commissions George Washington and sends him off to this location that was, would later become Fort Duquesne. And th that location is today, modern day, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So if you're familiar with Pittsburgh, you know it's, it's on this peninsula, right, where two rivers meet and flow into the Ohio River. So it's this strategically important location. So Britain sends George Washington over to what is today Pittsburgh to secure this location for Britain. So France can't do it because Britain wanted to build a fort there, 
but France also wanted that location. France wanted to build a fort there as well. So Washington encounters French troops and a battle ensues. You know, shots are fired, people die and all that. So George Washington was actually a, you know, he saw real action. He saw military action and he was engaged in battles and conflicts while he was fighting in this militia. So later, years later, when it came time for the founding fathers here to decide whether to break off from Britain and they decide to do it, declare independence, which kicks off the Revolutionary War, they needed to appoint somebody to be ahead of their new army here in America. So George Washington was a natural choice. He was born into the wealthy elite in you know this important state of Virginia. He was a military leader and he saw military action here as the, the leader in this militia. And he was this imposing commanding guy. He was you know over six feet tall and he you know had this big stature and you know he he commanded respect. So he was a natural choice. So the founding fathers appointed George Washington to be the head of the new Continental Army to lead the war for independence against Britain. So let's put good old Georgie boy up on the big board here so we can keep track of these founding fathers. So the founding fathers put George Washington at the head of the army so they have that component in place. But they still need to figure out how they're going to conduct this war against Britain. So what they realize is that all these 13 independent colonies, they need to come together, unify, and act as one against the British army. Because if they're divided and they're running around in their separate directions, it's going to be divide and conquer and there's no way they're going to win the war. They're going to lose the war. They're going to be crushed by Britain. So the 13 colonies agree, we need to unify and come together here. So what do they do? They, they meet and they decide to create what they call the Articles of Confederation. Now, many people regard this as the precursor to the Constitution, and it sort of was in that it was a piece of paper that was about working together, but it, it, that's really it. It really was nothing anywhere close to being the Constitution, and nobody envisioned the Constitution at that time, and, and it, it wasn't even close to the, you know, laying out what the Constitution laid out. So it really was not a Constitution. And in fact, what it was was it was this loose affiliation among these 13 colonies that they agreed to cooperate. So it did not create any sort of a federal government, did not create a centralized government. There was no president, there was no administration, there were no federal offices, there was no power that was given to any sort of a central body or a central government. All it was was this loose affiliation where these 13 colonies basically could vote on stuff. And if they all agreed to do something, then fine, they'd do it. In fact, many of the major decisions required a unanimous vote. <laughs> okay, now, requiring unanimity is, is something that is a recipe for not having an effective government because often you're not going to have everybody in agreement. You're going to have one or two people here, colonies, that don't agree. And if they don't agree, then you, you, know, you, you, you can't pass it. So it's not a very effective way of having a government. But nonetheless, this is the arrangement that they they agreed on and decided to go with. So, okay, so you've got George Washington, the head of the army. You now have the 13 colonies agreeing to cooperate with each other under the Articles of Confederation. So you are ready to go here and off they go and launch, you know, the, the American Revolutionary War against Britain. Okay. So George Washington here, as the head of the army, has first-hand experience as to what it is like to try to conduct a national operation, because that's basically what this army was and the war was, a national operation under the framework of this loose arrangement of the Articles of Confederation. He hated it. <laughs> Washington was miserable. He ended up hating the Articles of Confederation. He had such a hard time with it. Okay, so here's Washington, you know, as the head of the army. And so what does the head of the army need? Well, what the head of the army needs is soldiers, right? He needs men. Okay, so Washington goes out to the states and he says, okay, he submits a request. He says, here are the number of men that I need in this army to fight this war. And what do the states do? 
the states go, nah, you don't need all those men. Come on. They're like, here, we'll send you some men, but we're not going to send what you asked for. No way. <laughs> and they didn't have to, right? There was no requirement because under the system, these Articles of Confederation, there was no federal government. There was no power. There's no federal power. They were not required to do it. So Washington was endlessly frustrated at this. I mean, he, he, he was like, you got to be kidding me. You put me as the head of the army to fight this war against nothing less than the British Empire, by the way, <laughs> which is arguably the you know, greatest military empire in the entire world. And you're not even giving me enough men to fight with. You got to be kidding me. And the thing is that there was you know, sufficient population in the colonies at the time to, to, for Washington to actually build a formidable army to fight against the British Empire, but the states didn't give him the people that he requested. So he's endlessly frustrated at this, right? Okay, so he's got the army, he's got the, you know, these men, even though it's it's far less than, than he requested, and he's trying to make the best, you know, with what he has. But it's not only men that you need if you're the head of the army, you also need supplies, right? You need all sorts of stuff. You need, you know, arms, weapons, you need bullets, <laughs> ammunition, you need food to feed the troops, you need, you know, clothes, uniforms. So Washington puts together a request and submits the request to the states and says, here's how much money you guys need to contribute in order that we can build and supply our army. And what do the states do? They do the same thing. They go, nah, come on, you don't need that much money. We're not going to give you that. We'll give you some. Here, here's, here's what we'll give you. But we're not going to give you all that. Again, Washington is endlessly frustrated. And he suffered with this throughout the entire Revolutionary War. So his, his you know, troops, he, he had less men than he wanted. But also his troops were woefully ill-equipped. You know, it was amazing. I mean, one thing was is that they were not paid. Okay, they, Washington couldn't get enough money from the states to pay the troops their salaries. Okay, I, you know, so just imagine if you were a soldier back then, right? You you leave your your you know your family at home, you leave your livelihood, you come to fight in this war because you're going to get paid. That's how you're going to support people, and then the government tells you, oh, sorry, you know, we're not paying you. Don't worry, we'll pay you next week, uh, next week, uh, next month, next month. Yeah, uh, at the after the war is over, we'll pay you. <laughs> you know, it just kept getting worse and worse. These men weren't getting paid. It was extremely frustrating. Not only were they not getting paid, but then they didn't have enough food. I mean, it was close to starvation in some cases. You know, it was astonishing. So this creates all sorts of problems where the men are defecting from the army. You know, not only does Washington not have as many men as he wanted, but now there a bunch of them are defecting. He can't keep them together because they're not being paid. They don't have enough food. It's, you know, Washington had to deal with all these problems because the states were not, you know, kicking in what Washington viewed as their, their fair share here. So it was pretty, pretty amazing. In fact, you know, the, the story, the famous story at Valley Forge was, you know, one cold, difficult winter, the Washington's troops almost perished en masse when, you know, they didn't have enough food and they, they couldn't keep themselves warm because they didn't have enough clothes. It was pretty amazing. And their boots, you know, they, they were, the soldiers were expected to march, but their boots were, you know, falling apart and the army didn't have enough money to supply them with adequate boots. <laughs> You know, pretty amazing. So there's actually one great story about this. So this had to do with the Battle of Yorktown. So Yorktown was this city down in Virginia, and the French, along with the colonial army, Washington's troops, realized that the British were making a big mistake in Yorktown, and that they were sending a bunch of troops down Yorktown, and they were vulnerable there. So the idea was this was a great opportunity to attack the British at Yorktown. Now you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, the French? <laughs> did you say the French? What did the French have to do with this? You know, this, I thought the Revolutionary Army or the, the Revolutionary War was the colonists fighting against Britain. And that's true. Those were the two main combatants. But France was also involved. So was Spain, actually. Spain was involved too, but mainly it was France. France got involved on the side of George Washington and the colonists. Okay, now you might be thinking, why? Why would France get involved in this war in America? And the reason was because it was against their arch enemy, England. 
because remember, France and England have been fighting for centuries, you know, all around the world. So this was an opportunity for France to get involved in this war in America and defeat Britain. Now that would defeat Britain from its new colonial empire in America, and that would weaken the British Empire globally, and that would be an advantage to France. So that's why France joins the the war here and they sent a whole bunch of troops boots on the ground real armies they sent ships and and all sorts of stuff in fact there are a number of historians believe that america would not have won the war were it not for france sending in these troops now some historians believe that that america still would have won the war it just would have taken them a lot longer but some believe that uh, france was a decisive factor in this in this war now whether they were decisive or not is it, it is certainly the case that they were a huge factor because they really did send a lot of a lot of troops so um so so france now joins george washington in fighting the british here and you may be thinking to yourself wait a minute this all kind of sounds familiar <laughs> and you're right because it was not so long ago when george washington was in virginia in the militia that George Washington was fighting for Britain against France. <laughs> and now here we are in the Revolutionary War and George Washington is fighting with France against Britain. <laughs> oh, how the tables have turned. <laughs> but that's what was happening in the Revolutionary War. Okay, pretty amazing. So the, the French, along with the colonial army, identify this opportunity at Yorktown to attack the British at Yorktown. So George Washington agrees with this, although interestingly, this was not George Washington's main plan. George Washington always envisioned that war culminating in New York City. Okay, pretty amazing. But New York City was actually a central place for, for this war and for the British. So what happened was one of the early battles in the war was the Battle of Long Island. So Long Island is this island just outside of New York City. Actually, the Battle of Long Island was a fascinating story. So this battle was tremendously significant to the entire Revolutionary War. In fact, to the history of the entire United States. It is unbelievable what happened here. So this Battle of Long Island was a, an early battle in the war. So it occurred early in the war. In fact, it occurred right after the Declaration of Independence. So the Declaration of Independence was signed in July, July 4th, 1776. And this Battle of Long Island occurred in August of 1776. So the very next month after the Declaration of Independence. And it was a huge battle. It, was, it involved tens of thousands of troops. And in fact, it was the largest battle in the entire Revolutionary War. Okay, so it was an amazing battle. And the, it, it took place in the New York City area. And this is because New York City was a strategic location, a very important location for the English. So the English wanted to control New York City. And this was under the leadership of this guy, this guy by the name of General William Howe. So William Howe was, was, he was the top guy. He was the head of the entire war for England. So basically General Howe, he was the counterpart to George Washington. So just like George Washington was the head of the entire Continental Army for the colonists, this guy, William Howe, was the head of the entire British army in the war. So here in this battle, you have George Washington and General Howe squaring off against each other and here in the New York City area. Here is a larger look at the New York City area. So here is the island of Manhattan and here is the Hudson River and to the west of the Hudson River is New Jersey. And this is the East River along the eastern side of Manhattan. And down here is Staten Island. And then this is the Verrazano Narrows Bridge connecting Staten Island to Brooklyn. So this is Brooklyn and Long Island. 
So all of this is Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens, all the way. This is all Long Island. And in fact, Long Island is huge. So Long Island extends way off this map to the right, to the east. So it extends for miles and miles and miles off this map to the right, to the east. So Long Island is huge. So, but the Battle of Long Island takes place entirely in Brooklyn. So it takes place right here in Brooklyn. So in fact, this battle is also referred to as the Battle of Brooklyn. And also, the third name is the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, because this is a neighborhood in Brooklyn right up here, Brooklyn Heights. So it has three names, the Battle of Long Island, the Battle of Brooklyn, and the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. But all three names are referring to the exact same battle, which all took place in Brooklyn. Now, Brooklyn actually is sort of a, a funny name. It has a funny history. The, the history is that it was named by the Dutch. Okay, the Dutch. And the reason that it has a Dutch name is because the Dutch actually were the first European settlers to settle New York City. The Dutch actually discovered New York City and founded New York City. So this was back in 1608, and they named it New Amsterdam. Okay, this was after their city, Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. So New Amsterdam, they founded it right here, right in the tip of Manhattan, New Amsterdam. But then, about 50 years later, in 1664, the English sailed warships in here, and at gunpoint, the English took it over. <laughs> so the English took over New Amsterdam and renamed it New York. But the Dutch, you know, their legacy and their history has remained in the area, including in a number of these names, like Brooklyn. <laughs> so this is an old Dutch name, and, and what, it, it, what it means, it's derived from Brooklyn, Brook land, broken land. Broken land, that's what this means. Brooklyn, broken land. So the Dutch named it Broken Land. And the reason they named it Broken Land is because this land here, this area, has a bunch of hills and heights. And so it, it, what the, the Dutch were saying is that this land was sort of broken up by these hills and heights. So they named it Broken Land. And that's why it's named Brooklyn today. <laughs> so pretty funny. But so this battle, all took place here in Brooklyn. So what happened was when the English decided to focus on New York City and made New York City this you know, strategically important location, they sailed a bunch of their warships and troops in from the Atlantic Ocean and in up through the Atlantic Ocean, in through the Verrazano Narrows, and they settled in Staten Island. So the British basically took over Staten Island and used it as their staging ground, and they, begin, they began to amass a bunch of troops, British troops, on Staten Island. Okay, so let's take a look at the battle here that occurred in, in Brooklyn here, the Battle of Long Island or the Battle of Brooklyn. So this is Brooklyn right here. This map is Brooklyn. You can still see you know, the, the shape of Brooklyn. Here is, is Manhattan. This is the southern tip of Manhattan here. Here's the East River. Okay, this is about the location of the Brooklyn Bridge. This is Staten Island down here. So just to take a contemporary look of it. So this is a look of contemporary Brooklyn. You can see this is the area that we just saw. So this is the Brooklyn area. Here's New York City, Manhattan. This is the southern tip of Manhattan. Here's the Brooklyn Bridge right here. So this is the East River. This is Brooklyn Heights. So you can see this is Staten Island. So for people who are familiar with Brooklyn, you can see the contemporary neighborhoods today. This is all right where the battle was taking place. So you can see Bay Ridge, Sunset Park. This is Prospect Park right here. The neighborhood of Park Slope in Brooklyn. The neighborhood of Williamsburg in Brooklyn. The neighborhood of Red Hook. And then these are not labeled on the map, but right above Red Hook is Carroll Gardens, and then the neighborhood of Cobble Hill, and then the neighborhood of Brooklyn Heights. So right here is Brooklyn Heights, and right here is the Brooklyn Bridge and the East River. So that is the contemporary sort of map of Brooklyn. And now back to the military battle here that occurred here. So you can see this is the military battle here that occurred right in Brooklyn. So the red represents the British troops and the blue represents Washington's troops for the Continental Army. So what happened here to kick off the battle was the British started sending their ships and their troops across 
the Narrows here, this is basically right where the Verrazano's Narrows bridge is today. So from Staten Island over to Brooklyn. So they amassed a bunch of troops in Brooklyn and then they started marching their troops up towards to meet Washington, where Washington had taken up his positions. So the British march up this way to meet Washington and up this way to meet Washington. And this is exactly what Washington had anticipated. So Washington had moved his troops into these positions that he felt were advantage and he was waiting for the British to attack up this way. So this is what happens. So the, so the battle gets underway. The, the British forces come up and start attacking Washington and so the fight begins right here. These are the front lines of the battle. But then the British under the command of General Howe, they make a strategic military maneuver. <laughs> and what they do here is instead of sending all their troops to attack Washington at the front lines where Washington wanted to do battle, they take most of their troops and they send these British troops around this way. But they do this secretly. Okay, so Washington does not know about this. So they do this secretly. So they send these troops around the back way here, all the way around the back. And the idea is that they are trying to flank Washington's troops, come around the end of Washington's troops, come up this way and attack Washington from behind. Now, this is a classic military move of flanking your opponent's troops. And it really causes a devastating problem if you end up getting your, your troops flanked. So some say that this was a brilliant strategic move by the British and by General Howe. Brilliant. But others say, no, 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 no. This was a blunder by Washington because Washington should have anticipated this. It's a classic military move. He should have anticipated this and he should have been ready for it. But in fact, Washington was not ready for this. And this is what the British did and it works. Okay, works. So the British send most of their troops up around here and do this surprise attack and it start attack Washington's troops from behind. So this is an enormous problem for Washington. So basically what you have to do if you end up getting flanked and attacked from behind is, you know, all your troops are faced this way, right, attacking this way. So what you have to do is you have to take half of your troops, turn them around and have them start fighting this way from the back. And now you're fighting on both sides. You're fighting up from the front and you're fighting off from the back so now you're split and you're divided and thus you are very vulnerable to losing the battle so this is what Washington saw so when Washington realized he'd just been flanked and he was getting attacked from the back this was a big problem for him so what Washington decided to do is he made the strategic move to take his troops and pull his troops back out of this mess here. So if he could just pull his troops back here, then he would be pulling his troops out of this mess here where they're being attacked on both sides. So this was a smart strategic move here. But the problem is, is that whenever a military army starts to retreat in a battle, they become extremely vulnerable. Retreating is an extremely vulnerable time for a military army in a battle. And the reason is because, you know, you're falling back, you're going back, but at the same time, your enemy pursues you and keeps attacking you. So you have to do two things. You have to try to fight your enemy at the same time you're trying to go back. You become extremely vulnerable. And this is actually uh, throughout history, a lot of times where armies are wiped out is while they're trying to retreat. So this is a problem for Washington, but this is what he does. He, he has his troops fall back. So what happens is a small contingent in Washington's army actually does this very valiant move. They basically sacrifice themselves. So what they do is they basically come rushing up and attack the British. And they know they can't win the British because they're just a small group. But what they're trying to do is at least delay the British. And this will enable most of the troops to fall back here successfully. And this actually works. So this was an incredibly heroic act because most of the people from this small contingent ended up being killed by the British. But their overall objective was successful. Because their sacrifice was successful because it did enable most of Washington's troops to fall back here. So Washington's troops fall back here and they all come back to one location. They consolidate themselves in this one location of Brooklyn Heights. So let's take a look again at the contemporary map. So this is Brooklyn Heights. So all of Washington's troops fall back and consolidate group together here in Brooklyn Heights right here. 
So the British troops then, under General Howe, they you know are pursuing Washington's troops as they're falling back, and then they the British troops form a ring around Washington's troops, sort of surrounding him up by the land and pinning him up against the water. So Washington is in an extremely difficult position here now. He is trapped. He is trapped here in Brooklyn Heights, and he is surrounded up by land by the by General Howe's troops, and Washington can't really go into the water because the British Navy controls this waterway. So if Washington tried to go into the water, the British Navy would attack Washington. He'd be a sitting duck, and the British Navy would wipe out Washington. So Washington is trapped here. He's trapped by, by the British troops surrounding him by land, and he's pinned with his back up against the water here. So he is in big trouble here. So what does Howe do? Well, incredibly, General Howe orders his troop to stop the attack and instead to just hold their position right here surrounding Washington. So General Howe orders his troops to stop the attack. What is going on with this guy, General Howe? Why in the world does General Howe not attack Washington? I mean, General Howe's got him in this perfect position, right? General Howe's got him surrounded by land, and Washington's pinned down in Brooklyn Heights. His back is against the water. He's up against the water. He can't escape that way. So this is the perfect situation for General Howe to attack Washington and finish him off and finish off his army. And this, in fact, is what his own officers are telling him, right? Howe's own officers are saying, General Howe, Dude, we've got to attack. Let's attack Washington right now. Let's finish off Washington and his army once and for all right here, right now. We've got to attack. <laughs> but General Howe says, no, we are not going to attack. Instead, we're going to hold our positions here and just keep Washington pinned down. Ah, oh, this is an amazing decision. It's an amazing decision in the war, and it's an amazing decision for U.S. history. It is incredible. Now, it is an extremely controversial decision. It was back then, and it's an extremely controversial decision today. Why did Howe not attack Washington and finish him off when he had him? So... There's a couple explanations for this. So the main explanation, the one that is likely the case, is that Howe just didn't want to incur all of the casualties by charging Washington. So if Howe charges Washington, yes, uh, Howe's going to win the battle ultimately. But in the meantime, in this battle, Howe's going to lose a lot of soldiers. And in fact, this situation was almost the exact same situation that Howe had just encountered against Washington in a prior battle, the Battle of Bunker Hill up in Boston. So this had just occurred. So in, in the Battle of Bunker Hill, Washington had his troops in you know, this one position, and you know, Howe's troops came upon them, and Howe decided to charge Washington's troops. So he charged, and Howe won the battle, but Howe lost a ton of his own soldiers. And after that battle of Bunker Hill, Howe said, it wasn't worth it. The cost was too high. It wasn't worth taking that position and winning that battle because we lost too many men. So now here we are, the Battle of Long Island here in Battle of Brooklyn, and uh, it's almost the exact same situation, right? So now, General Howe says, no, I'm not doing that again. I'm not going to attack. So instead, what Howe's thinking he's going to do is he's just going to hold his positions and he's going to keep Washington surrounded and pinned down. And it won't take very long until Washington's going to realize that he has no choice but to surrender. And this would be a much better outcome from Howe's perspective, right? This is likely what Howe was thinking because a surrender would mean that Howe achieves his victory. He, you know, he, he defeats Washington's army right here, but he does so without a battle and without losing more of his own men. Great solution. Okay, so this is is the likely explanation as to as to why Howe did not attack. And in fact, this is the explanation that Howe himself gave subsequently. 
So others think though that maybe it had something to do with like like you know the chivalry, you know, and, and so back then there was this you know sort of you know, some of these officers would engage in this sort of gallant conduct of you know when they won a battle and outmaneuvered their opponent instead of just wiping out their opponent and killing them, you know they would allow their opponent to surrender, sort of doing the gallant thing. So that's another alternative explanation of maybe that's what Howe was thinking is that he would allow Washington the opportunity to surrender. So regardless of the reason, Howe does not attack and does not wipe out Washington. So Washington though here is in a pickle. <laughs> okay, he is in a difficult situation here, right? So he is pinned down here in Brooklyn Heights. You know, he's got no escape by land because Howe's got his troops surrounding him by land. And Washington has no escape by water because Washington's back is, you know, is up against the water here. And if Washington tried to escape by water, the British Navy controlled these waters. So Washington would be a sitting duck. The British Navy would wipe out his ships and then, you know, Howe would likely attack. So so, you know, this would be a disaster. So Washington is in a difficult situation here and in a predicament. So what does Washington do? Well, Washington decides to attempt a daring escape. <laughs> And his escape plan is that he is going to wait for night to fall and under the cover of darkness, Washington is going to try to escape across the river from Brooklyn Heights. He's going to try to escape across the river over to Manhattan. Let's take a look at Washington's proposed escape route here on the map. So here is Brooklyn Heights. So this is where Washington was pinned down and trapped here. He's trapped right here in Brooklyn Heights. And he's basically surrounded by Howe's British troops surrounding him here on land. So Washington's proposed escape route is to take his troops to the shores of Brooklyn Heights, jump on boats and ferries, and ferry across the East River to the safety of the shores of Manhattan. So this is Manhattan Island right here. Now, in terms of today's map, it's almost in the exact same location as where the Brooklyn Bridge is today. So right here, this is where the Brooklyn Bridge is today. Now, the Brooklyn Bridge did not exist back then at the time. It had not yet been built, but it's the almost the exact location. So Washington's escape plan, he's trapped here in Brooklyn Heights. He is going to take his troops and go from Brooklyn Heights across the East River and to the safety of the shores of Manhattan. Now, Washington's escape plan here is an incredible act of daring do. I mean, this is incredibly risky, right? If Washington is discovered escaping across the river here and he's found out by the British, Washington is going to be wiped out. The British Navy is going to attack. Howe is going to attack from the land. He is going to be wiped out. So this is an incredibly risky plan. But this is what Washington begins to do. So night begins to fall here and Washington begins to implement his plan. So he begins to evacuate his troops very quietly, you know, onto boats from the Brooklyn Heights side across the East River and over to the safety of Manhattan. So he's beginning this evacuation. Now, uh, <laughs> this is an incredibly difficult operation to evacuate all these troops. It was like 9,000 troops, right? So it was a, a logistical challenge here. But things just start to go wrong, right? There's all these mishaps and things get bungled and there's miscommunications and, you know, all, all these things, you know, start to go wrong. So Washington realizes that, you know, this may have been a big miscalculation that he is not going to be able to get all of his troops uh, evacuated before daybreak. And this is a big problem because when daybreak comes and the sun rises, there will be light everywhere and the British will be able to see that Washington is evacuating and they will immediately attack him and wipe him out. So this is a big problem. So Washington starts to try to, uh, you know, to try to accelerate this thing and get everybody, let's go, we gotta hurry up, we gotta hurry up. But this is an extraordinarily difficult operation to get 9,000 troops across this river, and it's just taking a long time. 
So the hours passed. They are still not anywhere near being done. And daybreak comes. The sun rises. However, out of a freak of nature, literally, <laughs> it turns out that a thick fog had descended upon the area. And this was an extremely thick fog. It was thick like pea soup. And visibility was horrible. You could barely see your own hand in front of your own face. Right? So this thick fog is what it, it impairs visibility. And so the British are not able to see that Washington is escaping. <laughs> so even though day is broken and the sun has risen, Washington continues his operation of evacuating his men across the river and the British can't see, so they don't know what's going on. So as a result of this thick fog, Washington is able to complete the evacuation, get all of his troops out of Brooklyn Heights, across the East River, into the safety of Manhattan. Washington's escape plan worked. <laughs> Now, this is incredible. I mean, this whole thing is incredible. And it is incredible to think that this escape plan actually worked. And, you know, if you think about it, you think about, uh, you know, how close Washington came to being wiped out here. And what would have happened if Washington would have been wiped out, right? Which was the, the more likely consequence here. What would have happened? How would history have changed? And history would have changed tremendously. I mean, there is the potential here that this could have ended the entire Revolutionary War right here. The war over, right? Britain would have just crushed this rebellion. The, the, you know, the, the revolutionaries would not have been able to recover from this massive defeat. So, and just think of the message that this would have sent, right? So, so here it was, the uh, American colony begins a, a revolution, and what happens? The British Empire sends in its troops, and one month after they declare independence, and basically the first major battle after they declare independence, they are, the revolutionaries are wiped out like that, <laughs> right? This would have sent this message that, you know, the British Empire and, and these colonial empires, you know, possess the supreme power and they will stomp out any, any, you know, revolutions here. So this would have changed the course of history. You know, the United States may never have existed, right? And in fact, to this day, you know, the United States may, could still to this day be a British colony, <laughs> right? It is amazing to think how close it was Washington escaped by a hair and how close it was to changing history. And in fact, it all comes down to these two events, these two sort of miraculous strokes of luck, really, right? The one was that General Howe did not attack Washington when he could have. General Howe could have wiped Washington out right there and then. And number two, that th this freak of nature, right? That, that this fog descended and this fog is what enabled Washington to escape destruction. It is an incredible story and an incredible occurrence here in the Revolutionary War. It's amazing. So even though Washington escaped here to safety and, and lived to fight another day, the British army continued their assault, assault on New York City. So they you know, went into Manhattan, they, they basically pushed Washington up and up up on, on Manhattan all the way up to the top. Then they eventually pushed Washington off of Manhattan over to the west into New Jersey and then they pushed Washington even further. So Washington ended up retreating out of New York City, down through New Jersey, out of New Jersey and into to Pennsylvania. So this Battle of Long Island, Battle of Brooklyn, was a huge victory for the British Empire and the British Army. And it was a huge loss for Washington and the Continental Army. So this was tremendously significant here in the war. And what it meant was that Britain then invaded New York City. And Britain took over New York City. And this is amazing to think about today, but this is what happened. Britain occupied New York City for the entire rest of the war. 
So as a result of this, Washington always envisioned the war culminating by Washington marching back into New York City, conquering the British, kicking them out, and winning the war. That's how he always envisioned this. But Washington was persuaded by you know, the, the, the French and, and the colonial troops that, no, no, this is a great opportunity to actually mount this huge attack against the British at Yorktown down in Virginia. So Washington agrees to that. He says, yes, you're right. This is a good opportunity. We need to, we need to take advantage of this. So what Washington needed to do in order to mount this attack is that most of his army was up north in New York. And Yorktown, the battle site, was down in Virginia. So he needed to transport his troops from New York down to Virginia. The only problem is <laughs> Washington didn't have enough money to do that. <laughs> Washington didn't have enough money to transport his troops from New York to Virginia. Okay, amazing. This was one of the problems that Washington was having with this form of government, this loose form of government under the Articles of Confederation. So what ended up happening? Washington ended up going to this private citizen, okay, this wealthy merchant. This is a guy by the name of Robert Morris. And he lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was this wealthy merchant. He was also in government a little bit too. He was one of the founding fathers of, of this country, but mainly he was a merchant. That's why he was so wealthy. So Robert Morris ends up writing a personal check <laughs> to provide the funds so Washington can transport his army from New York down to Virginia. <laughs> okay, it's amazing, amazing. So that is what happened. So the Battle of Yorktown then commences and it turns out to be a huge battle. It is a decisive battle in the entire war. It ends up winning the entire Revolutionary War for Washington and his French allies. They have a tremendous defeat of the British. The, the British are, are, are you know, suffer this tremendous loss here at Yorktown, and it is the battle that effectively ends the war. This is in 1781. So they declared independence in 1776. Five years later, you have the, the Battle of Yorktown, 1781. Now, the Battle of Yorktown didn't technically end the war because they ended up negotiating a treaty, and that treaty was signed two years later in Paris. So it was the Treaty of Paris in 1783 that technically ended the war, but it was the Battle of Yorktown that effectively ended the war because it was the, the last major battle. After Yorktown, there were no major battles. It was, it was pretty clear that Britain was, uh, was done for. <laughs> so uh, it is pretty amazing, uh, and it's pretty uh, a good thing that Robert Morris you know, wrote that check that transported the troops down to Virginia. It's also really a, a condemnation of you know the ineffect, ineffective government that existed under the you know the the loose Articles of Confederation because you know that the government wasn't financing that, that troop movement and that's what caused the decisive battle of the war. So it's pretty pretty amazing there. So. Despite all these difficulties with dealing with the Articles of Confederation, Washington endures, Washington prevails, wins the American Revolutionary War, Britain is kicked out, and America gains its independence.